Have a seat. So we close the door. Good afternoon. Welcome to this session two. We will talk about operations during this uh, this afternoon and tomorrow morning. This meeting room will be dedicated to the ops in general. So you are well welcome to this meeting room. So I hope uh, you enjoy your, your meal. It has been very soft. So now you are ready to talk, but before to listen. Uh, before to continue the, the discussion there, I want to introduce Isabel Del Pozzo de Poza, representing EHA. In fact, she is from Airbus Helicopters. But she will talk to you about uh, topics which will promote rotorcraft adapted procedure in order to equally integrate rotorcraft operation in the single European sky. So this is typically what we need in the ops. We need to, to have a, a better, I will say, uh, integration of rotorcraft with the new systems, pins, PBN, etc. So she will explain us, and you will have a, a better view on the, what we are going on for this kind of uh, uh, activities. Thank you very much. Please. So um, you want to hear me well? I need to Okay. Yeah. Good. Cool. So I'm um, going to try to cheer you up after lunch. Well, it was um, our long break. Let's see if we get back into the topic. So for all of you who think, oh my God, he's too young and maybe an intern, thanks. My secret <laughs> is basically, I'm based in Donauwood, which is quite foggy, and this is in a lot of humidity. That's my secret. So let's start now with a, a real topic. Let's see if I make this right. No? Um, ah, it's here. This one, no? Okay. This one? Ah, here it works. Just a little technical issue. Okay, maybe now. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay, so we go back. This is basically what I'm going to present today. Well, I hope that most of you know what EHA is, but I'm going to go quickly through it. What is our mission, our commitment with rotorcraft sector? What do we actually intend? Why are we speaking in all these different conferences and to all these different peoples? What are the operational needs and challenges of the rotorcraft? I hope we are quite clear on this side. Usually on some other conferences, they don't really know. Uh, understand our needs for low-level IFR routes and some other adaptation of the concepts and basically how we can move all together towards safer scenarios so that we can operate our rotorcraft longer, achieve a longer, a better operational availability and increase our safety levels and then basically the conclusion. So let's go. Rotorcraft, uh, EHA is basically the rotorcraft um, operator's voice in Europe. And as you see, there is a link to the OEMs, the industry. And that's where I come. I basically support the European Helicopter Association in more technical topics. In Europe, especially focused on the CESAR projects. So what is the mission of the European Helicopter Association, which actually our aim is to have a recognition of the rotorcraft unique capabilities? Adapt, tailor the rules, because the rules, because usually they are 
made for the fixed wing traffic and they don't take the rotorcraft constraints, requirements, capabilities into account. And this is usually some political controversial topic, equal access to the airspace, not only the single European sky, which is our aim in Europe, but all around the world, equal access. Why in the 21st century, the rotorcraft is still not integrated in the airspace? Why are we still flying VFR when we have the technology to fly IFR? Why don't we have a concrete structure in the low level airspace? Also to pave the way for future operations, don't forget that the drones will jump into the airspace, the new airspace user, and the low level airspace will be suddenly a little bit crowded. So we need to structure it a little bit. It's nothing new, it's basically just to achieve what other airspace users have achieved already, but also for the rotorcraft in the 21st century. I mean, it's time that we get the equal access also to the airspace. So, basically, what are the current watercraft missions? Well, I think this is all well known. Helicopter air ambulance, search and rescue, police, firefighting, oil and gas, which is also moving to the wind farm um, industry. It's not only exclusively oil and gas anymore. We're also talking about this oil and gas plus the transport of, pass of, of um, the appropriate crude to the wind farms. Air taxi charter. This is an interesting business also towards the future. Ideal work. So, maybe you've seen these slides already. They were presented, I think, a few years ago by some Italian operator and they've been used. It's a strong image and I think it's also an image that transmits very good our message. We have the highest technology in the newest autocraft, but we cannot use them. It's like if you buy a Ferrari and then suddenly this is your highway. So, have fun. It's going to be fantastic, isn't it? So, the authorities have been mainly focused on the fixed wing market. We understand this. It's more than 80% of the traffic. But, I mean, we are also part of the airspace. And we are also a user. So, rotorcraft capabilities need to be taken into account. And we still are not equally well integrated. What are our needs? So, it's three basic needs. We're pushing for point in space procedures to have IFR access to VFR um, helipods. We can do this now thanks to performance-based navigation, satellite-based navigation. Why? Because before we didn't have the navigation aids in all these areas where the rotorcraft operate. Now we are independent of navigation aids. We can define our 3D points, our routes with enough precision to actually be able to fly IFR and even access IFR um, to non-IFR equipped helipods or FATOS. Specific low-level IFR routes. Well, most of the IFR routes end at 10,000 feet. This is not a solution for the rotorcraft. So we need specific low-level IFR routes. And the next point, simultaneous non-interfering operations. Why? Because we also need to access the airports. And right now, the solution that we have is to follow the ILS path, speed up, be a pain in the ass for ATC because they need to m make a huge um, window, separation window for us, then fly over the runway until we can actually go to our heliport. It makes completely no sense. So we need to have our own rotorcraft procedures independent of fixed wings, simultaneous non-interfering operations. That's the keyword. That's what we're pushing for. They developed this concept for parallel runways, semi-parallel runways. Now we need to implement this concept for the rotorcraft traffic, independent of the fixed wing traffic, including misapproaches, for sure. We have done this already in some CESAR projects, Clean Sky project. We have demonstrated this also in Toulouse, key point. I think it's um, Clean Sky Y, one garden or care project. So just keep it in mind. It has been demonstrated, we can do it. We need to push for it. What are our challenges? We have the highest technology standards, satellite-based navigation, four axis autopilot, LPV certified, certified also to do steep approaches 9.9 .9 degrees. But there is no appropriate procedures for the rotorcraft. We want to move to 24-7 operations. How? It was still weather dependent. So basically this is the current scenario. Most of the rotorcraft still fly VFR and, sorry, as soon as we have a bad weather situation, this is the scenario. We cannot continue flying. Whereas the fixed wing traffic, they can fly with minimum modifications in the worst case. 
What does this mean? Either you need to fly very low or you need to abort completely your mission. This increases the rate of accidents with control flight into terrain and due to inadvertent IMC conditions. So why do we need IFR routes? It's exactly what I am um, explaining before. We need to increase the operational availability. It makes no sense that for emergency medical services, you need to go to the Alps, pick up someone that has been injured, and suddenly, oh, uh, low cloud ceiling. And you may not be able to land in the, air, in the hospital, or you not be maybe uh, not even able to take off. And now then an ambulance needs to come. It makes no sense. We have the technology. We have the procedures. We don't need to invent the new procedures. Performance-based navigation already gives us the procedural framework. We need to use that framework. We need the air navigation service provider to take the rotorcraft operation seriously and to support, to provide us with the infrastructure that is needed. Increase automation in flight. Well, it's basically, as we have heard this morning, it also helps and supports safe operations. Reliable and precise navigation. Why? Because basically we fly very near to obstacles, very low. And it's important to have a reliable and precise navigation. And this will basically reduce our accidents due to co control flight into terrain. We reduce the uncertainty. Similar to the fixed wing um, traffic, IFR routes reduce the uncertainty, you are able to plan strategically, you are able to do better, um, optimize your fleet operations, and also for ATC, they know where we are and what is our flight intention. And then in the future, just a keyword, think about 40 trajectories. This is something that at some point we will also push to have somehow implemented in the rotorcraft sector, not to be a pain in the ass for the operators, but basically to improve our communication with ATC so that they know where we are, where we want to go. IFR routes help, help defining effective safety contingency procedures. Well, you, as for example, go, um, landing into the airport, you don't only need the IFR procedure or the point in space to land in the heliport, but you also need the appropriate misapproach procedures. And this all also has to work in bad weather situations. So our stepwise approach. This is the interesting part. We have the performance-based concept, based navigation concept. This is what we want to use. We are pushing for low-level IFR routes. Maybe someone of you heard solution 113. So it's a solution that has been demonstrated in CSR 1 that we are pushing right now to have as a European law with some support, but still little support, especially air navigation service provider don't understand exactly our need and fear a little bit this extra work that they will have in control airspace. There are some discussions on it. So we are pushing for low level IFR routes, first based on RMP1, 03, 1, at an altitude around 6,000 uh, feet, 3,000 feet in control airspace. This is the first step. But then we want to lower the altitude, go towards 3,000, 1,500 feet. I put 1,500 feet because um, airspace class G, usually depending on national levels, it, it varies a little bit. The upper boundary of class G and the lower boundary of class E, but well, let's see. And move also towards uncontrolled airspace. This is something essential for the rotograph. This is something that we need to engage in discussions already now with EASA, with the civil aviation authorities, air navigation service provider, how to enable IFR routes also in uncontrolled airspace. Well, we probably need a little bit more automation on the air navigation service provider side. But this is not only for us. This is also to pave the future for the drone operations. Because voice communication with a drone is going to be a little bit hard. So, we need also to adapt um, the takeoff and landing procedures. We have point in space, but we need to improve the point in space procedures. It's far too conventional. It's basically an LPV approach with a straight in segment. We want to push the point in space concept to a more advanced point in space. What we talk about steep approaches. 9.1, we reduce the noise with the steep approaches. This has been also already demonstrated in Clean Sky 1 and CESAR and turns after FAP, because this is basically the unique capability of the rotorcraft. We can do turns up to the very end. I mean, okay, it depends on safety factors and so on, but we don't need the straight-in segment. 
And we usually need to land around many obstacles. So advanced point in space procedures will open the door to better access to non-IFR sites, including with obstacles around. On top of that, of course, we need accurate databases. This is another handicap blocking point that we have for our sectors. The databases are basically tailored for fixed wing use, and usually whenever you fly at low level altitudes, the obstacles that they say, they are not really there, or they are somewhere else. And narrow the safety margins. Why? Because it's nice to start with RMP1, but we need to move to RMP Air, RMP01. Why? Well, we have the example of Riga and uh, in the Alps. Basically, sometimes you need to fly in between the mountains and <laughs> there is not much room. So you need to fly RMP01, RMP1.15, um, sorry. Or even if you want to access urban areas. Well, we have cases right now where, the, especially in Asia, the cities are bigger and bigger with higher buildings. And at some point, you also need to be able to fly in urban areas. Remember the um, um, mission I told you before, air taxis, charters. This is potentially also a business case in the future. So we need to pave the way. If you want to continue, improve the business of air taxis, charters, in big cities with high buildings, probably the safety margins are going to be key. And we need to reduce them in a safe way. This is also important, global approach. We are not only aiming at a specific solution, a specific approach in Europe, but it has to go hand in hand with Asia, with the US. It makes no sense to be able to fly very good, very safe IFR in Europe and not have the same capabilities, the same options in the US or anywhere else in the world. At least the helicopters that we sell at Airbus helicopters, they are well equipped and we can sell them all around the world. So we need the appropriate operational concept. So what are we aiming for? Basically a structure in the low level airspace. To have IFR routes with the appropriate point in space procedures to achieve, to, to go into this IFR routes and to go outside this IFR routes. But the IFR route concept is basically to have the, a highway so that when you fly, you can still fly VFR, but if you enter in, into unadvertent IMC conditions, you know where is the next IFR route that you can deviate to, you have the highway. Then we can discuss about how to go into the highway, how to get out of the highway, but at least this minimum structure is there. This highway just to be able to move in different weather conditions from A to B. basically what I said before, and we slowly narrow the safety margin. So we start at 6,000 feet. We will discuss with the authorities to slowly move down the altitude to more appropriate um, operational and route altitudes, and then narrow the safety margins. We need to start at RMP1 and slowly discuss also with EASA how to um, adapt the RMP air concept to the rotorcraft sector. So, Conclusions. Low-level IFR routes brings safety benefits. Well, why? It supports reliable and precise navigation at lower altitudes near to obstacles, reduces the number of accidents due to conflict, uh, control flight in and terrain and IM, inadvertent IMC conditions. It enables us to move 20, uh, towards 24-7 operation. It increases the operational availability. We can also fly it in IMC conditions. Of course, the rotorcraft need to be equipped with the latest technology. It will certainly um, help us to understand where, is, where are the different rotorcrafts, reduce the uncertainty, know the flight intent of the different operators. This is especially an important topic for air traffic controllers. And we need, of course, the level, the appropriate trainings for the helicopter pilots. This is a key point, this is very important, and this is still a topic that our sector needs to work on. What are we trying to develop, to improve? So we still, low level IFR routes, that's something that we can deploy right now. The operational framework is there, the technology is there, the regulation is there. 
What we need to discuss with ESA and with other authorities is the advanced point in space concept and the adaptation of RMPI air to the rotograph sector. These are still discussions that we need to follow. We need to make them understand why do we need this. And the procedures need to capture, and this is something that most of the rulemaking tasks usually forget. We don't fly like fixed wings. It's a complete different world, complete different concept. So what are our operational needs? What are our unique performance capabilities? And this is basically the mission of the Helicopter Association that we hope we can engage and gain the support also from the operators and the authorities to make sure that the rotorcraft sector is at least well represented in the new procedures and that we can together discuss with CESAR, with EASA, but also with FAA and the different authorities around the world on how to better integrate rotorcraft procedures in the airspace and keep them safe, even make them safer. That's it. So the way we have to go is, of course, in that way. But one of the key points shown by Isabel is adapt, adapt the training to the pilot. Because a number of BFR pilots are not familiar at all with the BFR. So here, we need a concept, and we need a, a global approach. So training is a key element over there. We will solve probably easily the, I will say it in bracket, the certification of those kind, EBN and PBN. We, will, uh, we are now close to the end in terms of, uh, I will say, technology for this kind of operations. But we will have a big step uh, regarding the training and to adapt ourselves to this uh, new requirement. Because, because to fly as EMS operations, uh, probably you know, most of you, what the difficulties are but it is a matter of a daily uh, training and it's a matter of also a culture, cultural approach. So we need to work on that sense, but I'm sure it will be also a difficult subjective element to take into account. So we have to go that way, but we have to consider a global approach without forget the human person in the loop. Thank you. Now we jump to the pragmatic approach and now it will be a very good transition. Please, Heinz, you have the, the floor. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, EASA, for inviting me to present my thoughts. My work over the past 14 years, the motivation for advanced all-weather helicopter operation. Imagine that in the near future, we, as a community, could perform the missions with the helicopter anytime, anywhere, and that's particular under any condition. I mean, there will be conditions we are not able to fly, but we try at least. If you consider and build up your own risk model after seeing my presentation, think about operation, risky operation, missions for catastrophic release, where people are needed urgently medical treatment. In the, uh, demanding mountain areas like Switzerland, the only solution in bad weather, if you can't fly, is walking. There's no air ambulance or ambulance like urban area. Today, in HEMS and Rescue, for the time being, not flying IFR means flying low, close to the ground, in low visibility, and you don't have a clue where the obstacles are, at what risk. 
Now I'm going to present you some work we have done in the past, sponsored by uh, several EU project. So I would, where we do now go for this project, some of the history I mentioned before, the long time I have working since that. Then advanced uh, instrument approach procedures and the primary results of some flight campaigns we have done in the past. And certainly take home message for EASA and Eurocontrol. Uh, this is my hometown Interlaken, located in the central part of Switzerland between the two lakes, Interlacus. And you see the famous three alpine region, Eigermönch and Jungfrau, with the ski resorts very close by. Interlaken, as you can see, has a rega base on the old military airfield in Interlaken. It's not anymore used. And the hospital, which then is uh, the major treatment hospital in the region, particularly in wintertime where we have a lot of skiing. That doesn't mean we have bad ski pistes. <laughs> but uh, you see there are three fatas, uh, two ground-based and one elevated uh, fato on the hospital. Interlaken is quite a challenging environment. And the scenario was actually chosen because I want to challenge the instrument fly procedure. I tried to challenge Leonardo with the autopilot, with the flight management system. I, went, I want to find out what are the limitations, just seeing what is capable a modern twin aging helicopter can perform. You see there is the very narrow valley in the bottom, 0.6 nautical miles. The altitude is 1,877, and it goes then wait uh, for the mist approach to 1.15 nautical miles. There is no radar coverage. There is no ATC, except the close nearby uh, Air Force Base in Meiringen, which have a 9 to 5 operation with F-18s, but during the weekend there is no traffic at all, and no ATC. Coming back a little bit to the history, Hedge was the first project which was uh, done in collaboration with, uh, with REGA. Uh, we started a long time and in December 2009 we created an LPV. It was the first LPV to my knowledge. Uh, there was no certification uh, available on the 109. So uh, we get the support with uh, red label boxes. And there haven't been any criteria for LPV. So we have asked the commission to use FAI criteria. It was an LPV approach. The glide path was 5.13. And the mist approach segment was towards the Brienzersee, which is uh, to the east. And you can see it was quite a dramatic low uh, the age, it was 347 feet, an LPV. Elna, if we didn't do it, the, the MDA would be too high. So you can see using the LPV procedure uh, criteria by the FAA, it fits nicely in, in that uh, region. These are the flight validation report. We have done that. That was uh, Steve Hickok. I've created that procedure, he did the flight validation, and that's the part of the flight validation report. You could see how we did the flying and his remarks on the flight validation report. The next was Nastio project, founded also by the EU Commission. There was uh, the advance that we did some flights in August 2015. It was an RMP.3 procedure with an RMP approach, with a radius to fixed leg. The uh, obstacle clearance had to be increased by 100% because we are in mountainous area. The glide path angle was five degrees, and again, the missed approach segment was uh, towards the lake of Brienz, back to, with a turn, back to the initial approach fix. And of course, this was a floating uh, initial approach fix. There is no connection to the road at this time. And the missed approach cli uh, climb gradient was 5%. 
which in a helicopter is uh, nothing special, except that the standard would be 4.2%. And if you can see, just sticking to the rules in accordance to, F I, uh, uh, to the IFPP, the MDH was 950 compared to 300 and something before. It's re not really workable, I think. And, but it fits in, you could see 1.6 nautical miles at the end. And in all procedure in demanding operation area, it's always the missed approach segment, which creating problem. So you have seen that we are in a comp complex orographic uh, and weather condition. And also there are criteria you have to have some tailwind up to 40, 50 knots in mountainous areas. I can tell you if you have 50 knots in a valley like that, the visibility will be increased and the minimum, also the cloud ceiling will be never at the minimum. Wind speed in mountainous areas means good weather. It has turbulence, I agree. Low freezing level, something we have to stick with until we get the ice helicopter high operation altitude and, of course, a 24-hour rescue service. That's what our people expect, that we are able 24 hours. And we consider that pins, point in space, RMP approaches are not enough to obtain acceptable obstacle clearance altitude or height at some places in Switzerland. It's not only Switzerland, it's in the demanding environment. These criteria are not suitable for us. Going a little back in the history, we have uh, uh, collaborated in the Gardena Clean Sky project that was something produced by Pildo Lab. This is a procedure with radius to fix turn and descend in Lesu, that's in the Pyrenees, but we didn't went uh, or fly down to Pyrenees. We have used our full flight simulator located at Zurich airport, which is very suitable to try all these things out. And the good thing is that in, compared to other FMS, uh, our FMS does allow on Taylor database to fly uh, AR procedures. The other step, what just recently have been finished, was uh, we have the Engadin Valley, St. Moritz, a famous place, a skiing resource. It has no uh, approach procedure, a departure procedure in IFR. So we try to challenge the autopilot again and the flight management system, and, and, but also the, the, uh, the designer of the procedures. It was designed by EDS in Italy. It was the project leader in the PROUD project. It was homologated by SkyGuide. And the procedure was a RNPAR.1. And the time doesn't let me show you, but we had the total system error of less than 10 meters during the whole procedures based on SPAS. So going to the instrument procedure, the design criteria, now the new one, RNP.15, which is uh, part of the Horizon 2020 Five Lies project. Again, we try to Established the procedure according to RNPAR, fixed wing criteria. We're coming again over the Lake of Thun. The missed approach is towards the Brienzersee and return with a 180 degrees turn to the initial approach fix in order to avoid the CTR of the airbase in Meiringen. It's a point in space, RNPAR, doesn't exist. The RF flags are based on the demonstrated RFM criteria from the Augusta Westland 109 SP and the maximum uh, climb gradient in the missed approach segment was 8% and the angle of bank was maximum limited to 25 degrees and the temperature is minus 20 to 40. You see now the criteria we have been using at the beginning until the final approach fix we used the RNP.3 and in order to remain inside the tolerance which have been needed, we uh, used uh, RNP.15 in the missed approach segment. You remember the hospital is here, so missed approach segment goes like that, back over the hospital all the way to uh, the initial approach fix. That's the missed approach segment. 
procedure have been coded on our test uh, tailored database. It was uh, inspected or the flight validated in our full flight simulator. And we could see, easily see that uh, 109 SP under normal condition is capable to fly the procedures. Going back to the helicopter, Augusta Westland 109 SP, I have done some basic, really basic study. AMC 2026 for fixed wing, you see they ask for dual GNSS. We have two SBAS redundant dual flight management system, dual air data system. We have a radius to fix, which is uh, demonstrated and inside the uh, EASA approved rotorcraft flight manual. And the system is level A software, uh, DO 178. What is missing? The AMC 2026 asks for a IR, INS, IRU unit. We have, you will see later on, very capable AHARs, modern AHARs. And of course, there are no criteria for the time being for RNP uh, 0.15. It's no CFA available on that. And in uh, the difference to the AMC 2026, which is not consistent with the AFA, FAA criteria, the, the ICAO criteria. We are using SBAS for navigation, vertical navigation, where in the 26 they ask for borrow. These are now uh, the procedure, as you can see. Uh, the VINI is also uh, unique that in uh, helicopter you have a V mini of uh, in the approach of 45 knots. Uh, the minimum demonstrated and accepted turn radius is 800 feet, 800 feet. The glide pass is 5 degrees, the climb gradient is 4.2, and obstacle clearance height 322 feet. So we are very close to the FAA LPV criteria. The final approach speed is 70 knots, and in order to remain inside, uh, the missed approach segment speed is 60 knots indicated. What we have done in the instrument flight procedure, the main deviation from the ICAO RMP fixed wing standards are PINS concept. It's not foreseen. Approach RMP value of 0.3. The missed approach climb gradient is uh, bigger than 2.5. For a helicopter, no problems, even in single engine helicopter, in single engine conditions. We extended the maximum length for the RMP value. It's smaller than 0.1, and we consider the tail, uh, we have to consider the, the tailwind in the rotor uh, radius to fixed turn. Remember my statement: if you have strong wind, 40 knots or whatever, then you have good visibility. It probably won't use the missed approach. And uh, we have in the visual segment construction obstacle clearance surface. We do have some penetrations there. That's the helicopter we have been using. Now, if you go, uh, we, we did four flights, just four flights. One was fully coupled. <coughs> One was done uh, later on. You see flight number two. We pulled the CB of the GPS because everybody was concerned, what oh, if you're losing the two S-Bus equipment, if you have a shift in the two systems and so on. So we just did one, one flight without the GNSS. The second was flying manually, easy done, remaining well in limit, and the fourth was flying half scale up and fly full scale right in order to see the boundary if the protection area was sufficient. So this is the procedure, nicely done. Uh, these are some screenshots out of the simulator. They are not exactly the picture, otherwise they, uh, we have taken a lot of uh, videotapes and, and data, of course. But just to see the, the system, so it's a synthetic vision system, you have ground proximity warning, and you see the navigation performance here. This is uh, 0.3, and the actual navigation is 0.1 in that segment. It incorporates as well a radius to fix leg before then at the final. This is the uh, total system error. Uh, we do some post-processing. We have three, three independent units. It was done by uh, Mark Troller from Skyguide. They do all this post-processing by side of Pildo. As you can see, the total system error throughout 
the flight was uh, well in limit, absolutely well in limit, if everything is working fine. These excursion we do have here are, I'm not the mathematic, but the construction of radius to fix are incorrect. Physical, not possible. That's why we have the deviation. Otherwise, it should stick right on the line. Next, uh, the final approach segment. You remember it's a RMP 1 point, uh, 0.15. It's correct. And we have an actual navigation performance of 0.01. And you see here now in t that the system is absolutely capable to perform four axes, even it's an LNAV approach, RMP.15, on, not on Barros, it's on SBAS. It's not compliant with AMC 2026. You see here the boundary which are needed uh, to remain to remain in the, in, in the boundary of the procedure. And now the next step, I remember these are the indication if you lose the GPS, I think it's a valuable information that the route remains indicated is in, in compliance with the RTCA. So at least you have something to stick on, knowing that the position is not certain. And you see we had, of course, some deviation based off the FMS last position and the AHRs. We had some deviations on that. That's the way back. So we had an extortion of, on, on the limitation without having any GPS and the DR system was out for 12 minutes. I pulled the CB at the missed approach point, flying full procedure, the missed approach segment without GPS. There you see the deviation, the total system error was 0.545, the flight technical error was small, the biggest one was the navigation system error, of course. And the funny thing was uh, that you see that the navigation, and once we pulled back, the, uh, the sea beach jumped right on the track. So the take home message in order to better serve the community, by helicopter in air rescue operation, in all weather operation, in remote, hostile environment. We need in near future dedic helicopter RMP AR points, point in space criteria. It goes to the IFPP. We have to develop them and we have to push them and we are in a, in a good situation that with expert which have now done some art and which have done uh, interlock and, and so on, <coughs> that uh, we have members of the IFPP close by in Interlaken. So REGA will sponsor that we dedicate this uh, point in space criteria and give it to the IFPP for homologation. So that's the ICAO level. But of course we need also RNPAR certification requirements based on the existing technology. And that means the IRUs are not the solution for our problem. They are heavy expensive and probably never going to use. So we need other, other equipment and this now on the level of EASA to work with the industry, with the OEMs to create uh, these uh, requirements. And that is funny, you know, uh, even if GLONASS is part of Annex 10, we as a community, we can just say we negligent that this is not important. GLONASS, the Russian system, it exists, but we are not using it. So we need multi-constellation receiver taking in future GPS, GLONASS and Galileo. And I know there's a work, just started a working group about this, but there are combined receiver GPS, SBUS and GLONASS, and we should put that in. And one, and not least, that's very important thing we are facing today in Switzerland, you remember there is no radar coverage, no ATC. And more and more often the ATC is depending on radar. They are losing the capability of procedural control. They are not able to do it. The next thing is if you, if you have an ATC service like the area control center, which is working 24 hours, they are not allowed to give you approach clearance. It's not foreseen in their in their uh, license. So there's a thing we're talking about, Euro control. 
Voila, that's it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Heinz, thank you very much. Very professional. So here we have a very good example. Now uh, we pave the way to, to better work in these kind of operations. But as you can see, uh, we need uh, to have a, a really professional approach and a global approach on that way. We are fully supporting what has been developed by, by Rega here, at least from EASA. And uh, I am sure, I am sure what you recommend at the end we will be, we will be probably all the time listening. I just have a, a sign to my colleague over there. Just, you see what you have to do now. Okay. And we, we have understood that the initial system is not well welcome at the moment in the proposal of Heinz. So I don't know what you have in, in mind, but what could be the next uh, technology proposal instead of having a INS, yes, thank you. So now let's move on. And Mr. Paul Dickens is over there. Please, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, this is something very different because it's not about aircraft, it's not about procedures. It's really about that key safety component that sits somewhere between the cyclic and the seat. Um, it's about the, some of the factors that make for effective commercial helicopter pilots. Are many of you pilots? Oh dear. <laughs> I just need to know how many people I'm going to insult. Are any of you, any of you psychologists? Oh, all right. <laughs> The only time I have ever been to a conference where there was an actual fist fight in the audience was between two psychologists, so <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> Very quickly, who am I? Uh, one of seven accredited aviation psychologists in the UK. Um, also learning to fly, as you can see with this thing, which really says something about my sanity, so my bank manager tells me. Uh, work with a number of manufacturers, but also with operators. And some of the work I'll be discussing was carried out with one of the operators listed there. What are you going to hear? A number of things. Um, why it's important. What this big factor, this big five factor of model of personality is. Uh, something about the profile of rotary wing pilots. And so what, what does it mean for safe operations? A lot of it goes back to this. The recent interest in this lies very much in a fixed wing accident with which I am sure you are very familiar. It occurred in 2015, a German wings flight from Barcelona to Dusseldorf, not very far away, um, crashed in the Alps. Um, 150 people died. And because of the speed of the impact, the wreckage was scattered over a wide area. And very quickly it appeared that the cause of this crash lay somewhere with the first officer who was pilot flying, who had locked the cabin captain out of the cabin and proceeded to cause the accident that happened. Um, after that, there was a great deal of outcry, as you might imagine, in the press, some of the British press the next day. Um, very quickly after that, IASA put together a task force to look at the implications of this. Uh, and one of the recommendations of that task force was this opinion. All flight crew should undergo a psychological assessment before commencing line flying. That recommendation is currently with the uh, European Commission and should be, I think, in operation by the end of the first quarter next year with a two-year implementation plan. So the whole point about understanding something about the people who fly aircraft is becoming much more salient, whether they're fixed wing or rotary wing. 
Um, what's this big five thingamy? I live in Scotland. Thingamy is a Scottish word. Uh, it's really whatever else you can call it. You can't really find a word for it, so we'll call it a thingamy. Well, the, what's this big five? Well, first of all, if you look at all the personality measures that there are, that, and you do a meta-analysis of them, you come up with five factors. And the key thing about these five factors is they've been shown to be incredibly valuable in describing human behavior behavior in general and specifically in the workplace. They are linked to job performance and as we also know they are linked to safety. This is what they are. Some of you may be familiar with them already. The five personality factors, so-called big five. Extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism and openness. I won't ask you to rate yourselves on each one of those right now. I have done that, but we don't have time. <laughs> OK, so what's important about these? Well, we've known that pilots are slightly different for a long time. Um, and what we do know about pilots are a number of things. There's a lot of research on pilots. Much of it from the United States Air Force, who have used this model extensively in initial selection and also in things like promotion to command. But most of that research doesn't differentiate between pilots. It doesn't really tell you much other than pilots as a whole. Um, but we have seen from some of the USAF studies that there are actually quite differences in personality between platform types. If you take it outside of the rotary wing world to fixed wing world, you'll find a great difference in the type of people who are best suited to fly fast jets and those who are suited to fly utility, cargo, passenger. Um, some of you may know the work of, of Sharon Clark, University of Manchester. If you don't, it's well worth having a look at it. She looked at these big five factors and she related them to safety incidents. And she found that unsafe operators across a number of safety critical um, situations tend to show low A, agreeableness. They don't really get on with people very well and they showed low C, conscientiousness, they don't really care. So the sorts of people who tend to have a high number of incidents really are not the sort of folk that you particularly want around the organization. Um, yeah, this is just some of the, the US Army work. Um, these are the sorts of things you get on rotary wing pilots across the total US Army and the cargo and utility. Cargo and utility is up there because it's closest to North Sea operations where this work was carried out, or my work was carried out. Okay, this is the work I've done. Familiar operator to you, I'm sure. Um, CHC has a policy of thorough psychological assessment of all new hires. In fact, anybody that touches an aircraft, whether they're an engineer, um, whether they're in search and rescue rear crew or whether their pilots go through a rigorous psychological assessment, which I've been doing since 2012. It, uh, this work covers all the North Sea operations and some search and rescue operations. Um, I don't have time to go into that differentiation either because there's an interesting differentiation there <laughs> between people who are best suited to search and rescue and HEMS type of operation and those suited for car utility flying offshore. Um, we use the Big Five Inventory, which is a measure of these Big Five personality factors, and it included everybody, whether they're permanent or contract staff. Um, the EASA ruling just says anybody that is going to be involved in line operation flying will come under this particular mandate for psychological assessment. So it's going to come very close very soon to many people in the room. 
Okay, we use something called the Big Five Inventory. It's readily available, it's useful. It's got a number of features that are worthwhile using with the population. Uh, it's got something called high face validity. In other words, it looks like it's answering a set of questions. It's not got these silly questions, you know, I'd rather be an apple or a tomato, those sorts of silly questions you get in personality inventories. It doesn't ask that sort of thing. It asks things that are very close to people in terms of understanding themselves. Um, it's also highly reliable, which is, again, good because, yes, I could end up in court. Somebody takes <laughs> a dislike to the wife, my findings. This is the sample, 226, all had ATPLH, CPLH, um, average experience quite high, the range quite interesting. Um, if you look at the basic training, roughly just over half had had um, a civil background and a military background. Why is that important? Well, people from the military background, A, have undertaken a lot more psychological testing in the process. People from civil background tend to be people who have often had other careers and have then gone on to um, become helicopter pilots because that's what they've always wanted to do. It's not unusual to come across people who've had very successful business careers, sold the business and used the money to, to um, get the license. Um, of this number, most were utility pilots, i.e. flying offshore, some SAR pilots as well. Um, 260 male, that's the balance. If you look at all the CAA figures, by the way, in the UK, that's about the proportion of male to female. It was very interesting looking around the audience this morning through there. It's probably the same balance here. <laughs> Predominantly male. Uh, age range, 21 to 63, all, all assessed pre-hire. Now, that I suppose you could say, well, okay, they want a job. <laughs> They're going to fake good, aren't they? But luckily, our test is sophisticated enough to be able to pick up people who are faking good. And in some ways, there are things about faking good as a, as a concept that is worth looking at. In, in itself. But most of them were people who were actually going through this process and, and doing it willingly. They weren't being forced into it. They were always asked, do you want to go through this? But obviously there's an easy answer to that. If you want a job, you're going to say yes. Okay, that's what we found. Straightforward findings. Um, not very significant, ex slightly more extrovert, not a great deal, a little bit. The size of the bubbles are indicative of the strength of the relationship. Significantly higher agreeableness. They tend to get on with folk, which is what you want, because we've seen that unsafe operators tend not to. People who work in teams, people probably been through lots of CRM. They know the understanding about how you work with other people being key. Um, significantly less neurotic. <laughs> we'll look at what that means in the meantime. They're pretty resilient people. You know, they're not folk who are going to get highly anxious at the slightest thing that comes up. Um, and significantly, the largest relationship, significantly conscientious. Um, one of the rules of thumb of psychology is to take all the behavioral markers you can get to validate what you see in the tests. One of the behavioral markers I use is conscientious people always turn up for interview at half an hour before they're supposed to be there. If somebody hasn't done that, then there's usually an issue with conscientiousness. And it's almost you know, a, a perfect correlation. So conscientiousness, the behavioral marker, is very strong. Um, and, and so those are the, the, the significant tendencies. Openness is about the same. That's about being open-minded, about being creative. And there's quite a number of people actually score lower on that that are pilots. It's not a creative thing. You're not there to um, think about all sorts of highly creative artistic things. You're there to fly an aircraft. So what? Well, it is important because if you delve into the AMC that accompanies the uh, forthcoming ruling, you will find suggestions about what should be assessed. 
One of the things is personality. And that's why this is important. It's one thing assessing it, it's another thing knowing what the heck you are looking for. And what this research is showing is if you're looking at what the personality characteristics of rotary wing commercial pilots look like, it looks like this. I hasten to add commercial terms of North Sea operations because I do do some work with people who are a very different type of character, who fly single crew, who do some remote operations with very few other people that they come into contact with, and they tend to show a very different set of characteristics. That's for another day. So, pilots were more conscientious, more agreeable. Good, there's a safety box has been ticked. Um, it's, okay, I've, this is saying, Akustand is niedrig. Got a problem. <laughs> if I close it, no, it's stuck. <laughs> yep, let's go. Good. Okay. Okay. What does that mean? They're more likely to be meticulous, procedure-driven, and organised. They're more likely to work effectively in a team. They're likely to be resilient and calm under pressure. I can see some of you thinking, really? <laughs> that doesn't fit with some of the colleagues I've got. Well, um, they do show the personality characteristics of safe workers, okay? What does this mean for psychological assessment? Given that this is going to be mandated, it's gonna come in fairly soon, in the next two years. Well, firstly, a personality assessment could ensure you have safety-related traits. Um, I know many other organizations other than CHC do psychological assessment. There's a whole pile of aptitude assessment this is suggesting something different, personality assessment being important. We do need to research predictive validity. The relationship between this data and actual job performance is what is really interesting to me. I've had many a conversation with a chief pilot which says something like, you really passed him, did you? <laughs> you must have been on having an off day that day. Um, because his performance in the sim and his performance is really not up to scratch. And then, well, that's the sort of information that's absolutely vital. It's the predictive validity of what we're doing. And that's the next step in this activity. Um, I do believe very strongly that when you start to implement the regulations, you have to think about using something that has an evidence base, which is this big five personality factors. Um, and we know it can differentiate people in terms of desirability and personality. Okay, that is it. Thank you very much, Paul. It was excessively interesting. Now we better understand how we we work, but it will be part of the question. So now I suggest you to start a question and answer. We do not have any slide or so. The audience will have to, to question by themselves and we will try to, to, to answer. Doctor, class G airspace, how do you get from your pins approach to, to go proceed VFR en route and keep yourself separated from VFR traffic in the Class G airspace. How do you get that into your safety management system? Yes, uh, what we did is a mathematical model. You want to ask, Doctor? Yeah. The, doctor, all good. All the good doctor, the first presentation. Oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Too many doctors. <laughs> Too many doctors. <laughs> so your question was VFR en route from a point in space? Yeah, I'm doing a... I'm mm -hmm. 
I'm on one of your proceed, your IFR level car is 6,000 feet, I, I, IMC. So I come to my part where I can do a letdown to proceed VFR. Okay, so I yes. IMC letting down mm -hmm. on my helicopter only approach, uh, helicopter descent. How do I keep myself deconflicted by someone who's underneath in class G airspace yes. preceding um, VFR? How do I write that into my S SMS? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> and this is basically one of the concerns we have also with the air navigation service providers because um, there is a handover of the responsibility when you are coming from the control airspace and you're entering the uncontrolled airspace. I'm not in controlled airspace. I'm Class G the whole on my, time on my on my low level PBN route. Yes, so but I'm if not you're in flying, controlled airspace. But if you're flying IFR, the rule is uh, very clear. You continue your procedure in IFR, and the VFR traffic needs to deviate. Oh, so my VFR traffic has got no transponder. He's got no radio. He's a microlight. How do I keep clear of him? Very good question. I know. <laughs> But I'm, well, I'm, I'm not worried that, about the drone. He should be under 400 feet, and my no proceed VFR so, en route is probably going to be above 400 feet. So, so right now there is no solution for this scenario. But basically, so first step is the IFR traffic remains in its IFR route. VFR traffic needs to clear the way, and there is a mandate to get a transponder in general aviation rotorcrafts in the next years. We need to have some technology to be able to see the traffic around us, also in airspace class G. It's not only because of the rotorcraft, it's also because of the drones that are coming. So yes, there are still questions that we need to solve. And yes, there are many scenarios that are going to be tricky in the first steps of the implementation. But there is no way around. We need to have a clear structure in the lower airspace, and we need to make our traffic or the vehicles flying around us visible. So there has to be some uh, transponder equipment, some way of making the people visible to the rest of the traffic. It's hard enough getting a GA pilot. I know. In his he isn't going to put a transponder in his aircraft. No, not for so a transponder. I'm not thinking about a specific ADS-B device. I know already the whole discussions about the equipment, it's expensive and so on. But we need to use, for example, all this hip, all this trend from the drone operations. They are talking about SIM cards. I mean, everyone has a mobile. You can locate the people with a mobile. Why not use this same technology for drones, for rotorcraft and general aviation? Uh, still a solution. Thank you. So, hello. I'm working for a national authority in the south of Germany. My name is Sabine Kraus, and I'm also a um, commercial helicopter pilot IFR rated. So I know, uh, I know uh, about what I'm speaking. <laughs> so the first thing was on your first picture, for me, there was licking the general aviation uh, and the training organizations on your first picture with the lower airspace and you must know in Germany I can only speak for Germany the people of the general aviation they want to be seen by ATC so that's the first problem the second thing is if I started my career as woman in the helicopter family an older uh, helicopter pilot said to me please Sabine never start your IFR training and do it because then your colleagues are flying in good weather conditions and you with the IFR trained uh, program you have to fly in bad weather conditions without de-icing systems on our helicopters in Germany. I never saw on your um, picture what we uh, urgent need to get the uh, uh, IFR routes in low airspace we need not only well-trained pilots, we need also the de-icing systems at the helicopter. That's the second point. But now I come to the third point, and this is really, really a big problem. You know, if we have an airport with IFR routes uh, for fixed wings, we have around the airport a circle, a safe, secure uh, sector, 
It's about 1.5 kilometers. Yes, the control area. Uh, we call control it Bauschutzbereich. Oh, okay. Yeah. And everyone who wants to erect their a crane or a building, which is going into the sector of the IFR landing or take off sites, has to ask before erecting yes. the authority, can I do that? We don't have these sectors around the typical landing sites for helicopters. So if Mr. Berger is flying in Interlaken and Mr. Miller wants to wreck the crane in the night, which is going into the IFR sector, we had fatal accidents every week because our authorities in Germany, they have not so much people going around every day to look is there a crane or a new building uh, beside the landing site of the helicopters? This is really, really dangerous. And uh, no one will hear me in the authority when I say this is a really big problem. So perhaps it's really so that the IFR routes is not the solution for this wish to fly 25, uh, 24 hours, seven days, in every weather without seeing what the people are doing there. So okay. I can tell it only to you from the authority side. So um, coming back to your three points, yes, training, IFR training is a key issue. It's an, I think in general the IFR training is um, a problem in our sector. There, is n there are not enough IFR routes to have a population of pilots well trained for IFR routes and IMC conditions. That's maybe also tailoring this um, feeling in the pilots that if they do the IFR training, they will be only uh, set up for operations in IMC conditions, which increases the rate of accident right now. But this is something that we need to, to see how we can improve the situation. And is, if we have an appropriate IFR route network, the option is there for the operators to use the IFR route network. So I guess that there will be a kind of natural evolution on the operators to use more the IFR route network, to exploit the operational availability via the IFR route network. So there will be not this uh, kind of disadvantage on the pilot sector if they do the IFR training. That's um, at least um, the feedback that we have, and this is also the reason why we are pushing for IFR route network. Regarding the de-icing, yes, you're right. This is also what um, Heinz uh, Leipengut is uh, basically also highlighting in the name of Riga. We also have other operators stating the same thing. It's not only about IFR routes. The OEMs also need to take into account that if you want to fly in IMC conditions, even at 3,000 feet, you need to take into account the as soon as you enter the clouds, you may enter in de-icing uh, problems. So, yes, and as far as I know, we at Airbus Helicopters, Leonardo Helicopters, different OEMs are also analyzing this problem. There is no solution yet, that's for sure, but we are on it. And then um, the last topic that you mentioned, obstacle clearance, obstacle, yes, obstacle is a key point for the rotorcraft sector, but we need to um, differentiate. So the IFR routes will be usually high enough to not be dependent on the obstacle. The problem that we face as soon as we approach the, fate, the, the FATOS is on the point in space uh, procedure, so the approaches and the departures. And usually you have an obstacle clearance in order to uh, define your point in space. There is a, 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 from the point in space procedures up to the final approach fix, you have a way of uh, flying the, the procedure in IFR modus, and then you go into proceed visually. And depending on the obstacle clearance that you have, you can actually proceed visually with hands-on, or you can proceed visually completely in manual mode. This depends on the obstacle clearance, and usually around the fate, the FATOS, the operators have a similar concept as what you described for the uh, airports, that there is an area where the cranes cannot be installed. But yes, we face this issue almost every day also on uh, hospitals in the cities, but the problem does not affect the IFR routes, 
because they are high enough, it's usually in the approaches and the departures. And there is still a lot of work to do because it's not only that the crane is suddenly there, it's basically that even static obstacles like uh, windmills, they don't appear on the, op on the databases. We are, uh, as EHA, we are working together also with Eurocontrol to see a way how we can integrate the geodetic centers of all the different nations, we have, which have more accurate information, to transmit this information to Eurocontrol so that they can basically publish this information and gather this information in the databases. But still, the obstacle clearance in the areas where the rotocrafts operate is a key issue that we need to address. It's not only IFR routes is one side, it's basically the infrastructure we need in the air, but still on the ground we need to make sure that the appropriate information is in the cockpit. Yes. Thomas Rüder, Hems pilot and for a European Cockpit Association. There is another problem, to my opinion. Uh, again, we are uh, with a ground structure. When I try to go somewhere with a helicopter, I, not, I even now have a, have a problem to getting weather information. So when I go uh, for pins approaches, who, who, who is uh, g giving us the weather, sta weather bases or weather stations we need and weather forecasts for this? Who is willing to pay for this? Um, a, a hospital may be flown for four days a week, of even five or seven days a week with one flight, will not be able or not be willing to pay for, this, for the weather station. So uh, how, how do you expect to solve this problem? Well, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I know that there are many topics that we need to work on, so as well as for the obstacles, the weather information, um, Unfortunately, there is the CESAR project SWIM that is still not in place and will not be deployed for several years, but uh, SWIM, the system-wide information management system, uh, the first objective was to solve exactly this issue, to be able to provide accurate weather information to the different airspace users by using basically the weather information of all the different vehicles flying in the air this is not yet available and will probably not be available in the next coming years. Um, for sure, there is, there is a problem that we don't get the right data. The data that is right now provided is basically either around the airports or tailored for the fixed wing traffic. Yeah. But this is basically part of our work. Um, if they are talking about a single European sky for all the operators, we need to make sure that all the operators are taking into account. So it's not only rotocraft. The same problem is for general aviation, business aviation, secondary airports, same topic. So yes, there are work to do and please feel free to come to the EHA. I mean, there are different working groups via the operators. We can probably try to see how to make lobby because at the end it's a kind of lobby activity, consciousness, education of the authorities. Yeah. What you and your colleague from the Rega say, um, give the impression that it, the system is ready to start now. And this is, uh, this is the question, uh, the fo following the questions have been raised there. Uh, at which timeline do you think the problem have been, so, have been solved and we can use the system because it, if it works and if it really would, be, would work, it would be a great benefit, of course, no, no question. But there are so many items to be solved until the, uh, that I have my doubt that we see it within the next 10 to 20 years. So that's why we have defined this roadmap and uh, we need to go step by step and um, the basic here is to try having deployment, concrete deployment. Unless we start having concrete IFR routes, IFR route networks, flying them, using them, really getting into the t in, in touch with all the different problems, we will not realize all the different problems that we have. We will stay only on this paper format, which does not self uh, solve any issue. So, as I explained before, we are pushing for low-level IFR routes in control airspace at 6,000 feet, 5,000 feet. We will lower the altitude, first RMP1, and then slowly moving to narrow the safety margins. And in parallel, we need to discuss what has been highlighted by Riga. RMP air needs to be adapted to the rotorcraft. The concept is basically just described for fixed wings. 
Um, we need to push for advance point in space, steep approaches. There are different ways of including the unique capabilities of the rotorcraft into the existing performance, and this is not the case right now. Yes, I think uh, you just have to consider that as a global approach, and probably it will be faster in some countries than the, some of the other ones. A uh, country like Switzerland, they are very well in advance because they have a full support from the different organizations, states, etc., etc. So you need to consider it will be not necessary. You will not go at the same speed. So consider it as a global approach, step by step, as explained by Isabel, and you have to accept in time frame of few years it could be the solution. Not immediately anywhere, but why not? considering in a 10 years' time in the different countries. So please, another question? Yeah, a question also on the same, on the same uh, area, which is we're now installing uh, helicopters with uh, HTOS systems, and we have a huge problem of databases. And my question goes to, to Heinz uh, Leibungut from Switzerland. How do you guys manage to have a proper database, whereas if you're flying around in Germany, it's just terrible, and in fact, you're better off switching off the HTOS system almost because um, you're likely to miss 70, no, 80, 90 percent of the obstacles are just not in there. How do you manage to do it in Switzerland? We have our own database. The Rega database? Yes. So what we did, uh, you know, we're flying occasionally out of Baal to the southern part of uh, Germany since several years, more than 20, 13 years, flying primary and secondary missions. And we start to actually ask the high power lines owner to send us the data. And we are implementing the data in our uh, Euronav DMAP system. Beside that, in Switzerland, every obstacle which is above 25 meter outside the urban area must be reported. And that gives the answer to the lady from the LBA. Uh, in the hospital, we are considering there is the 60 meter rule. So every obstacle or house or building which is above 60 meters must be reported to the government. And in order to uh, mitigate the cranes, our obstacle clearance in that area is 60 meters. So you can build in the approach 60 meters in the VFR segment. And the difference to fly VFR VFC for a pilot perspective is absolutely the same. See and avoid obstacles. There's no protection about uh, like in the VF visual segment. And if I have the microphone, I can ask the gentleman, I think from, from your accent, your English, isn't then IFR in golf already uh, practical? In, in England, that you have the same problem? Wait, sorry, wait. That you are, in England, you are allowed to fly IFR in golf without yeah. ATC. So the problematic doesn't, doesn't matter if it's a helicopter or not. Um, I, I, I totally agree with you, but you're a, you're a very stupid pilot if you do fly in cloud without some form of ATC. No, uh, the problem at the moment is, yes. as military fields disappear, the low, the low level ro radar cover is disappearing. Yeah. People aren't willing to give you any sort of service. So you see, that's our approach. And I urge EASA and our regulator to use the approach. Actually, we are talking about performance-based navigation. And we should actually go for risk-based operation. So what is the risk and the probability that you have an ear miss in that area? I know the figures. From, because I've done our math about this. And how many pilots had a near miss? Okay. And raise I'm your sorry. hand. How many, how many pilots had a near okay. miss? It Let's, was always. I'm not, not going to go. I've got my accident investigation yeah. branch set next yeah. to me. They're busy investigating only within the last month a Cessna and a helicopter mid air collision in, via, in a perfectly clear day. Yeah. So the big sky That's theory doesn't work. Ex exactly. That's what I. My own experience, it was always grand beau visibility. It was never in marginal weather. That's the funny thing. All the near misses I had, personal life, was in very but you, well but weather. But you never saw it in cloud, did you? 
No, you didn't see it in but cloud, 99%, unless your TCAS yeah. saw it, but, you wouldn't have no, known you but, missed something. But 99% of all the gliders in Switzerland have a Flarm Flois equipment. Okay, let's go. Sorry. Thank you very much for this debate. Interesting, passionate people. So we have to stop the question for the time being because we expect to have a break. We will come back in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Normal operation is about 10 to minus 5. A near miss yes. without any controlling and yeah. not every near near.